Hello everyone, welcome to Silicon Valley Media's theCUBE, CUBE Conversations here in our studios in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, our next guest is Siddhartha Agarwal, CUBE alumni, we first met at Oracle Open World, really focused on, on the developer open Oracle model of bringing developers together with the Oracle and Oracle Cloud, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Oracle. Siddhartha, well, good to see you again. Welcome to the CUBE Conversation. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me here. So one of the things I, I like about Oracle um, in covering you guys for now on our eighth year, we've been at eight Oracle Open Worlds, is we get to see the transformation. And one of the things, and we also cover Amazon Web Services like a blanket as well. Microsoft is sure not so much because they're just now new to the scene, but you know, you're starting to see the big players really flex their muscles in the cloud, Oracle's one of them, is that Oracle on Oracle is a superior product because it's Oracle. <laughs> Oracle Cloud is a superior product because it's Oracle in the cloud for Oracle customers. But you guys get a lot of criticism in the market from competitors around Oracle not on Oracle. So people that are new to Oracle, cloud native for instance is a market. And I just think that's you guys, uh, it's not a fair, it's always people always attacking each other. But more importantly is that you guys are doing the work mm -hmm. with developers. Yeah. And so I, let's, I want to talk about that with you because you have a developer focus mm -hmm. that's about being open. Sure. Share this, this is important. I will take a minute to explain the Oracle open. Yeah, no, I mean absolutely for us it's very important for developers to understand the Oracle Cloud Platform is open, modern, and easy. What do we mean by open? It means you can bring your programming language of choice, so you don't have to use Java EE. You could use Node, Ruby, PHP, JavaScript, whichever language you want. We're giving you a choice of databases. Obviously, Oracle databases, you could leverage those and get great value out of them with high availability, redundancy, reliability, et cetera, in the cloud delivered as a service. But at the same time, if you want to use open source, for example, MySQL, we deliver that as a service. We give you the choice of using Cassandra or MongoDB on our IaaS platform or on our PaaS platform. So lots of choice for the programming language for the database and choice of the uh, shape that you want to use on uh, IaaS. So for example, you could use VMs, you could use containers, you could use uh, um, uh, um, you know, just bare metal. So giving you screaming performance on bare metal as a developer, you might want that. And then running any of your open source workloads. So if you mm -hmm. want uh, Bitnami images with one click, you can run that on Oracle. So our focus is not just for Oracle content, but to be an amazing cloud for Oracle and non-Oracle content. This changes the ecosystem dynamic, certainly for Oracle as, as you guys expand. But you guys have open source, you have Java, you have all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's new to you guys, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, kind of, it's important for them to know that. So I got to ask you a specific question. As you guys have a more of a focus on open, mm -hmm. um, which is just you know, classic ecosystem, development. Mm -hmm. The world's changing, right? So right now, the, the hottest topic in the world mm -hmm. is really two things. IOT, Internet of Things, mm -hmm. and AI. And mm -hmm. AI has now surpassed, artificial intelligence AI is are surpassing mm -hmm. IOT because mm -hmm. most people don't even know what IOT is, mm -hmm. so they just, but AI sounds mm -hmm. sexy and glamorous. <laughs> you know, you know yes. intelligent machines, flying saucers, uh, yes. flying cars. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on that's real engineering work and R&D and mm -hmm. practical applications right. that point to that AI and data is, is certainly a mm -hmm. hot market and mm -hmm. certainly relevant. Yeah. Your thoughts on how this developer focus connects with that world? Actually, I think that uh, developers are going to become even more powerful than they already are because artificial intelligence requires two things. You need to be able to have these smart algorithms that are able to do analysis, but those smart algorithms cannot do anything unless there is really valuable data behind it and lots of data, right? So I think there'll be this next generation of data providers for AI. For example, with Oracle, we're providing the data cloud. 1.2 billion consumer profiles, 400 million business profiles. So now, when you want to do segmentation of a particular customer, a developer can call APIs and without having to go get all of that data, we're actually aggregating that data off of all the websites visits and all the on-premise transactions that are happening at various department stores, retail channels, et cetera. We're aggregating all of that into the profile of who a consumer is. And now these developers can access the data through, through their framework libraries, et cetera. Yeah. So they can actually yeah. write really intelligent applications because they've been able to leverage this data to train them. I, speaking to the choir here, I love this so much because I wrote a blog post in 2008, <coughs> data is the new development kit. And it was kind of riffing on this notion of development mm. kits when the old Microsoft days, MSDN, and people have development frameworks for their, mm -hmm. for their stacks. But I was pre the premise was data is then going to be a development ingredient, mm -hmm. a critical one. Mm -hmm. So the question for you on this AI thing is, does data trump algorithms or algorithms trump data? Or 
You know, some are saying data Trump's algorithms, some people saying algorithms are Trump's data. Which comes first? Is it the chicken and the egg, the cart before the horse? What is your I mean, thoughts? Algorithms have always been there, right? What's been missing, the parts that have been missing is one, being able to accumulate this much data, and two, to be able to process the data, and three, to have the compute power to do predictive analytics at scale. Right? So algorithms have always been there. There have been smart people that have written these algorithms, but those three things are the ones that have prevented artificial intelligence from becoming real. And yeah. now the data being aggregated, the speed of compute and the amount of compute that is available to you, those are things that are going to drive artificial intelligence to become real. So power's there, you got the, you got the computing power, mm -hmm. you got the data, mm -hmm. and the algorithm is just going to kind of keep on developing. Yes. And that's where machine learning seems to be the real transformative ingredient in yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, next topic is the my favorite one, which is I've been talking about on my show on Silicon Valley Friday show, which we do every Friday morning yeah. here in the studio, is the whole chatbot craze. And you and I were talking before we came on mm -hmm. this interview about how that really is evolving, this deeper meaning behind what mm -hmm. chatbots mm -hmm. actually are. Mm -hmm. um, I've been calling them kind of like glam and, and sizzle to AI to give people a mental model, but most chatbots are kind of gimmicky. Mm -hmm. um, customer support here and there, some applications, but there's deeper meaning behind a chatbot application. Mm -hmm. um, what's your thoughts? And you had mentioned to me that you think by 2018 you're going to see chatbots. Some are saying it's already here. Why aren't chatbots ready for prime yeah. time? No, it's, uh, look, our, we as consumers are getting tired of using mobile apps. So for example, I fly a lot and I download a Lufthansa app, a United app, a Delta app, et cetera. I'm downloading all of these apps to check in, do the same kind of stuff. But I have one messaging platform that is really popular, which is for me, Facebook Messenger, for example. So I want to be able to go and engage with Delta by friending the Delta bot and be able to say, hey, give me my, my boarding pass or do something, right? So I'm tired and fatigued with all the apps that I have. And so the next generation of engagement is going to be around how do I engage using my messaging platform of choice? Now you asked a very, very good question, which is why haven't these bots been more successful? It's because it's not easy to build a bot. What are the things that you have to think about? You have to think about a platform that scales across Facebook, Messenger, WeChat, WhatsApp, et cetera, right? So you have to write that for mm -hmm. various different platforms. You have to have natural language processing built in. You have to have an intent engine because people don't necessarily say the same thing every time when they want to get something done, right? Like I could say, tell me my balance, right? Now is it for checking or savings? Or I could say something different mm -hmm. next time. And so you have There's to- There's no reasoning. There's no linguistical kind of it, reasoning exactly, engine. Exactly, but you've got to have that, right? An intent yeah. engine. And then you have to learn. As you engage with a particular user, you have to start learning how do they engage with you. Those are the kinds of things that we've built into our mobile chatbot platform so that developers can focus on writing very rich bots that engage the developers yeah. to cross sell upsell, uh, I mean the customers and to cross sell and upsell, but not have to necessarily worry about the underlying infrastructure that is required to make this happen. Yeah, the big theme with, with uh, every interview I do in the cloud is around operating systems of the future, which is that global internet, mm -hmm. basically. You're talking about basic I.O. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Think of it like a PC. Mm -hmm. You plug a keyboard in or Bluetooth, you got uh, input output coming in. This is kind of the interesting thing about chatbots. You want to unify yeah. your mobile experience but in a way that unification isn't just mobile, it's mm -hmm. other platforms too. Isn't the unification the core theme driving some of these challenges? No, well, it, it's uh, about you know, which messaging platform is important to you and how do you bring in all this data and the analytics capability that we were talking about before mm -hmm. around the amount of compute that is available to apply that intelligence to the bot so that when someone is engaging with you, yeah. they're not feeling like, oh, it's a machine or it's someone that has a script that they're reading. It's actually someone that can understand your intent. Right? Yeah. That's what the unification And also is reduce the steps it takes to do things, to your example. Yes. I mean, I'll say early on with mobile, I mean, why download an app when you only need it once or twice, right. or it's seasonal, the NFL is, is, season's over, the sports season's over, now I got an app right. on my phone, and got to wait another year. Right, so well, if, I, you know. if I type in boarding pass, it should automatically figure out, okay, which is the next flight yeah. I'm going on? Am I within the 24 hour window? Mm -hmm. And oh, that's the boarding pass he probably wants. Well, Google's and doing that right the now. boarding pass I mean, right there. Google's, Google's doing that right now. Yeah. My email's synced 
step. Okay, the next one, let's go down deeper in the stack. Let's kind of drill down, because yeah. now you, you go to the next question. Mm -hmm. What is the key uh, uh, driver behind that? Is mm -hmm. it the microservices? Is it the containers? Is mm -hmm. it the DevOps? Mm -hmm. So assuming that that chatbot stuff needs to be coordinated mm -hmm. and unified, mm -hmm. what's under the hood mm -hmm. that makes this all happen? Well, I think you know um, developers want to be able to build their applications quickly and test them, right? And the key trend that we're seeing is many more containers being used compared to VMs. So for example, if you think about the size and scale of development environments, they're three to 10x that of production environments. So containers are going to become much more popular than VMs. But those create challenges for developers because now they have to think about how do I orchestrate the container? For example, Kubernetes is an orchestration engine that requires etcd as a mechanism to manage what's the primary versus the secondary, et cetera. All of that developers shouldn't have to worry about. Or yeah. whether Kubernetes is going to be around or not, and there's a new version of this and a new version of that. There's a land grab in the entrepreneurial world around who's going to own the management. That's it's a, a nightmare. That's a wonderful point, absolutely. The, the technologies are immature. So if you bet on a technology, is that technology still going to be around, right? That's the other thing. And the last thing is, for example, you know, I have my container spread out on a few nodes. The load balancer on the front end is saying, hey, I'm getting workload and these servers are utilized in this way and I'm going to send this uh, request here. But that, but that server that it sent the request to didn't have a container on it. And a lot of people are building an orchestration mechanism that is moving the request to some other server, but that's going against the load balancer's requirements. So scalability becomes an issue. And developers don't want to think about all of this. They just want to be able to use containers and benefit from it. And that's why the next trend is to be able to have container as a service, where developers can just bring their container, not have to worry about orchestration, not have to worry about scheduling, not have to worry about scalability, and it's all taken care of. And that's what we're delivering with our application container cloud capabilities at both the PaaS level and the IaaS level. So the developers are becoming more relevant. You mm -hmm. guys are obviously investing in that area and amplifying up, which is really positive. Mark heard, again, chatted with me about the use cases, and obviously the applications are coming. You're mm -hmm. downloading a ton of apps, and this is everyone's mm -hmm. getting overloaded with mm -hmm. apps, and more apps are coming, so it's right. not like it's, they're going away anytime mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like the mail, it keeps coming and coming, but more apps are coming. So, but the use cases are shifting from dev, uh, dev test, mm -hmm. This is what Mark Hurd told me. It's all dev test. Certainly that's the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. But now as workloads are moving to the mm -hmm. cloud, there are mission critical applications that are moving to the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and then some workloads are, have better cloud and on-prem kind of characteristics. By 2020, how does that shifting, your thoughts on this, and, 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 and the role of the developer in all of this? Yeah, no, I think there are a few things that are going to happen. One is that line of businesses want to fail. And what, I, what I mean by that is they want to try 15 different things and they know that only two or three of those will succeed. In the past, they would think and they would think and they would think and they would think before they mo made a move into a particular area. Now they're saying, I just want to try and I'm perfectly fine with failing. Well, what does that require? It requires one, being able to test your things really quickly and making your customers part of your development team by putting out an application that they're comfortable with not being complete not being completely feature rich, et cetera, but getting the feedback on what works, what, what doesn't work. So the number of releases that are going to happen are going to go up significantly, and they won't follow the regular release paradigm because these line of business folks are themselves going to become developers. So mm -hmm. one is the number of developers is going to increase significantly mm -hmm. with the citizen developers. They'll be able to release the uh, products very easily, meaning the minute they're done with the, uh, making changes on a browser, it's live for customers to use, right? And then the other thing is developers have to get very comfortable with working in this constraint where they're not building everything perfectly and making sure that they can support the business. So Arthur Agarwal here inside the CUBE conversation. Final uh, uh, mm -hmm. point I'd like you to make is share with the folks uh, what's some of the action and where can they get resources around this developer. For developers watching saying, hey, you know what, I'm really not Mm -hmm. Familiar with Oracle, or I'm yeah, familiar with Oracle. Yeah, yeah. Obviously Oracle has a lot of influence in the mm -hmm. marketplace, mm -hmm. huge install base, customer base. So you know, developers want relevance, but they also want to have a partner to monetize their work. Absolutely. And this is important. You guys are, have an opportunity mm -hmm. here in my opinion. So mm -hmm. what uh, would entice a developer? Where can they go? What should, where should they go? 
to play around and learn more yeah. about some of the things you're doing about being open? Sure, um, so first of all, developer.oracle.com, easy to remember. It is going to be a one source for all the information, and it's not just going to have Oracle content on it. It's going to have content on DevOps, microservices, containers, APIs, chatbots, machine learning, AI, and that content might come from Oracle, it might not come from Oracle, so that's one resource. Second is we're creating, we've created a series of 20 city events called Oracle Code. These are free developer events, so free for developers, focused on those six or seven areas that I just listed, like microservices, yep. jackpots, machine learning, et cetera, coming to 20 different cities. We put out a call for papers um, in December. We've gotten 1,200 uh, uh, submissions for people who want to present at these events. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be just Oracle people talking about Oracle content, but it's about what is important to developers. And You're not jamming Oracle content. down their throat. You're embracing uh, a conversation. Yes, and we're helping their education. The other thing that we're doing is we're sponsoring a lot of non-Oracle events. We know we have to go where developers are. Mm -hmm. So for example, we just completed Developer Week up in San Francisco, and uh, they had a ton of developers, and we showed them how they can have API-first development, how they can build microservices behind those APIs, and then how they could leverage chatbots to dev deliver a rich experience. Tremendous reception, they loved it. Uh, the other thing is we've created a advocacy program called Oracle Champions or Oracle Gurus, where non-Oracle folks can be talking about Oracle content or topics, and we promote them in the environment. And last is the Oracle Code Startup Accelerator. So we want to support startups, we want to give them environments, and we want to give them mentoring and give them a stage to talk about. So the Oracle Startup Accelerator is enabling that. So if, you, if the developers want to try this, go to cloud.oracle.com slash try it. And you'll get a free account with a certain amount of resources for you to try. So Arthur, thanks so much. Congratulations and, and great to see you guys out there pounding the pavement, really engaging the developers where they are and being open. That's awesome. Excellent, glad to be here. Cube thanks, Conversation, John. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching.